Okay, well, I think we will get started here today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Ripp, and I'm the Academic Services and Programming Manager on behalf of the Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program here at UW-Madison. And we are super excited to introduce you today to our speaker, um, Dr. Christine Hippert, who is a professor of anthropology in the Department of Archaeology and Anthro at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Today she'll be discussing her new book, Not Even a Grain of Rice, Buying Food on Credit in the Dominican Republic, which was published just this year. Dr. Hippert teaches courses on the anthropology of food, medical anthropology, culture change, social, economic, and racial justice, and Latin American and Caribbean studies. As a cultural anthropologist with a graduate degree in public health, she has conducted long-term ethnographic research for over 20 years throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, primarily in the Dominican Republic, Bolivia, and Mexico. She has also conducted applied anthropological research in the U.S., including a leading including leading a collaborative team of public health practitioners and undergrad students in an evaluation of the farm to school program in the school district of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Her research examines people's experiences of community development, health care, and food security as they relate to social constructions and the cultural politics of racial, ethnic, gendered, and national identities. The results of her research have been published in many interdisciplinary journals, such as Food and Foodways and the Journal of Latin America and, the, and Caribbean Anthropology. She's a former president and an active member of the North Central Council of Latin Americanists and a regional faculty associate with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at UW-Milwaukee. Uh, today, I also want to mention that we are grateful to the Food Studies Network at UW-Madison for co-sponsoring this lecture. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. And um, Dr. Hippert, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you so much for everyone for being here to hear a little bit more about my new book. Um, this is going to this is going to be a book talk. Um, so there's going to be a lot that I say that I sort of paint with broad brushstrokes. And I'd be happy to answer any specific questions in the question and answer period, the last 15 minutes of the hour. So um, I am uh, a cultural anthropologist and I work um, at an institution where I teach a lot. Um, so I was interested in writing a book that I knew that I hoped uh, my students would enjoy reading, right? So my research is about the cultural practice of buying food on in-store credit. In Dominican Spanish, that's the noun is called fiao and the a uh, verb is called fiar or fiarse. And I was interested in how this practice and um, works and what it tells us about race, racism, gender, and inequality. And um, this credit is not in store credit that you can use in a big box store, like a, like a festival or a cub or you know, a woodman's. Instead, this in store credit is being used with people and shopkeepers in colmados. Colmado Spanish word essentially, and the Dominican Spanish word for a, a bodega or a corner store. And these corner stores are the primary shopping venues of all people, um, really honestly in the Dominican Republic, but most certainly in my field site um, in an international tourist destination on the North shore of the Dominican Republic. I wrote the book, um, Not Even a Grain of Rice, for specifically for undergraduates, but I wrote it so that hopefully um, people who know a lot about the region can get something out of it and learn something new. Um, but I also wrote it so that people who know nothing about the region can learn a lot about it. And if you're interested in teaching my book, I think that my book would be a really good fit on classes related to, or, you know, like not courses, class periods and units on food and community development, household economics, like, you know, how poor communities provision their households, um, qualitative methods. I go into detail about particularly um, reflexivity so how um, me, I am a, I identify as a white cisgendered, uh, you know, professional woman who doesn't have to worry about feeding my kids. And that sometimes um, got in the way or created rapport between me and the people that I worked with. Um, I, would, I would talk to others and they would turn around and start interrogating me um, in different kinds of ways because of how they viewed me. And so I, I talk a lot about that in the book. 
um, it would be good, my book would be good for course periods on inequality and gender, race and racism, as well as tourism in Latin America and the Caribbean. A lot of classes talk about tourism as sort of the answer to development, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. And my book shows us that, um, you know, tourism is not necessarily the um, sort of the ticket out of poverty that a lot of um, particularly economists want to make, you know, help us think about that. Um, each chapter, I have an intro, four chapters, and a conclusion. Um, and the book is, is, is short. It's only about 150 pages. Um, but each chapter begins with a story from my field notes. So I wrote my book with a lot of thick description. That's sort of an anthropological term to basically mean that I, I give a lot of description and I try to put the reader, I, I try to give the reader a sense of what it's you know like to be there and what you hear and what you smell and what you taste and you know definitely taste because this is a book on food. Um, and um, I'm going to read. I'm going to read one of these stories because this story um, really will get at the heart of a lot of the things that I want to talk about today in my talk. And it gives you a sense of um, what's going on in the book. This is the field note story from chapter four. And the name of the chapter is called The Door is Always Open Until It Isn't, The Hidden Labor of Becoming Gente Responsable. I wrote these field notes on October 3rd, 2014. Pepe's Corner Store is at the heart of the Callejón. The Callejón is one of the two neighborhoods where I do my work. Located at a major intersection where a side road forks, serving people living on both arteries running through this residential district. His is one of the most popular colmados in the Callejón and arguably one of the most frequented in all of Cabarete. Cabarete is the town where I do my work. Even when I first started working in Cabarete, it was easy to spot Pepe, a 60-year-old Dominican man and a lifelong resident of the Callejón who typically works shirtless with salt and pepper hair, short, salt and pepper short cropped hair and a wide smile. I've lived here long before the Callejón was as big as it is now, he explained. He lives nearby the Colmado and each day I often found him sitting outside or across the street from the store in the requisite white plastic chair so ubiquitous throughout the Dominican Republic. Interestingly, Pepe infrequently works inside his Colmado. The only times he was seen working in the Colmado was when he butchered animals made for order made to order for customers, a role he saw fit only for himself, or sometimes to go over the purchase orders from distributors or accounts of customers' debt. Those who typically worked behind the counter and at the register were young men in their late teens, like Manuel, a 19-year-old single Dominican and long resident of the Callejón, who was working this morning when I arrived at 7.15. Along with Manuel, this morning Pepe was in the Comado too. When I arrived, he was in the later stages of butchering a chicken for a customer who had made the order by phone. After finishing the meat order, Pepe gestured to me in pure Dominican fashion with his lips scrunched up to the side of his face and a quick nod of his head and eyebrows raised like this. First looking at me and then over to the plastic chairs outside the colmado. We made our way over across the road about 15 meters away from the colmado to sit in the shade and talk. My questions for him today were all about how and why he allowed particular customers to buy food on credit. The door is always open for responsible people, said Pepe. You know, those who I know will pay me. I've heard this phrase, siempre la puerta está where the door is always open, often from other shoppers, from other shopkeepers, as they talk to or about their most trusted customers. Pepe means this metaphorically and perhaps a bit literally as well since colmaderos or shopkeepers are known to get phone calls in the middle of the night from customers needing emergency supplies. I need these customers. I have debts, you know? If, those, if these responsible people don't shop here, they'll shop somewhere else. I would be ruined. I work hard to keep the doors open for them. In response, I asked him, when is the door not open for someone? How do you know that someone will pay you back? Oh yes, the door closes, that's for sure. Ah, si, la puerta se cierra, es cierto, Pepe, Pepe replied. I can't give everyone credit. If I did, I can't pay my own debts because there are lazy people here, those who don't work, and they're thieves and wouldn't pay me back. And then I said, but what about people who only work during tourist seasons? Are they lazy? Do you allow them to buy on credit when there are no tourists, I asked? Well, my friend, yes, this is a problem. For these people, they are responsible people when they're able to be. But more than anything, I'm talking about the Haitians. I can't trust them. And then I said, so you mean like Joel and Esther? How about 
appears to me that you lend to Haitians quite a bit, I pushed him. Well, yeah, I do, but they're not like other Haitians. Like who? What do you mean? I asked. Well, I suppose they, meaning Joel, Esther, and Robe, have become gente responsable, or responsible people. They prove that to me, was Pepe's explanation. And then I said, are Haitian customers the only ones who are not responsible, who fail to pay their debts? Do Dominicans do that too, or is it just Haitians, I asked. No, you're, you're right. There are Dominicans too, conceded Pepe. The door is always open, Cristina, until it isn't, you know? So I wanna talk about the goals I've set forth in my book, right? Um, just so you know, I have a lot of photos here and um, there's a bunch of, there's a, there's a number of photos in my book, but all of the photos I've taken um, shots of except the last one because I'm in it and somebody else took it for me. So the two goals of my book are, are this. I wanted to examine the ways that poor communities in neo-colonial settings, especially multicultural communities that are magnets for migrant labor, provision their households, right? The second goal of the book was to illustrate people's experiences of race and racism in a global context. So my book um, talks, gives a, a thorough history of Dominican-Haitian relations, right? So this is a, a map of the Dominican Republic. The, my field site called Cabarete is on the North Coast and that's where that sort of like topi brownish uh, circle is. It's about a 45 minute drive east of Puerta Plata. Puerta Plata is sort of the seat of international tourism on the North Coast. In fact, Sosua is a very famous town. Um, you can't see it, it's under the little bubble, but it's in between Puerta Plata and Cabrete, and that's the red light district of the North Coast of, of Dominican Republic. Just for point of reference, Santo Domingo is on the South Coast um, right here. And a lot of times I have students in my classes who say, oh, I've been to the Dominican Republic and it's Punta Cana. And this is Punta Cana over here. This is a resort, a place of many, many international resorts. And I've never even been there, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a highly touristed place, but so is the, the North Coast. So my book talks a lot about Dominican-Haitian relations. And I refer to um, a phrase that Samuel Martinez from the University of Connecticut, an anthropologist said that there's this sort of narrative of Dominican-Haitian relations that can sort of be depicted with the fatal conflict model. The fatal conflict model of Dominican-Haitian relations basically says two things. It says that there's structural tension between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, like the countries, and that they're in a duel over power. And there's lots of books and articles written about this structural tension, um, you know, like, um, uh, you know, How the, Cro the Cox Fight by, um, what's her, Michelle Wooker from the, the year 2000. And, and there's, there's lots of books that talk about the structural tension. But part of the fatal conflict model um, includes tense interpersonal relationships between Dominicans and Haitians. So this fatal conflict model, you know, sort of encapsulates the relationships that have evolved over at least a couple hundred years of history that involve colonialism and the slave trade, um, not only European colonialism on the island of Hispaniola, but also um, Haitian colonialism of the Dominican Republic. So um, in the, the mid 1800s, uh, Haiti, which was, um, you know, a, it's the second oldest country, modern nation in, in the hemisphere. It crossed the border, its armies crossed the border and took over the Dominican Republic for a number of years. And in fact, on February 27th, um, that is Dominican Independence Day, and they're celebrating independence from Haiti, not from Spain, which was its sort of its first or, you know, sort of um, colonizer. So what people like Samuel Martinez says is yes, there has been a lot of conflict between the countries of Dominican Republic and Haiti. And in fact, there is some interpersonal tension between Dominicans and, Haitian, and Haitians. But the thing is, is that a lot of the research that we have about Dominican-Haitian relations actually occurs in intra-cultural communities like um, Bates in the Dominican Republic, which are essentially, um, for a long time, they were just Haitian communities, work of people who work in the sugarcane fields, right? Or there, would, there was a lot of research um, in places like Little Haiti, 
which is uh, you know, an enclave of Santo Domingo, which is sort of a stopping ground for people from Haiti coming to the Dominican Republic and then moving out elsewhere, getting jobs. But Martina said, look, we actually need more research on the increase, like the increasing number of communities of intercultural relations. And you know, and so this included a lot of border communities. So people like Kimberly Wynn and Elena Guzman have been writing about border in, in Lauren Derby. They've been talking about border communities for a while it, with regard to, you know, a lot of like Haitians that will cross the border and, you know, stay for a little while and then go home. But it was I was particularly interested in learning more about intercultural relations in international tourist destinations where not only Haitians, were um, migrating to, but also internal migration of Dominicans to the North Shore in order to work in um, tourism, but also internationals. So there's a lot of people from Quebec, you know, other places in Canada, uh, very few in the United States, Norwegians and Finnish and, you know, people from Australia and New Zealand, all over the world, Russians, all over the world who were living and working in Cabarete. And so I was really interested in looking at venues where people come together, and they have like intercultural conversations and interactions. And one of those places are colmados um, because food shopping always requires intercultural engagement, particularly in, uh, in Cabarete between Dominicans and Haitians. So let me just briefly talk about my research question and objectives. So my research question um, was, how does in-store credit to buy food affect interpersonal intercultural relations? So pe people that are known as Dominicans, Dominical Haitians and Haitians in an international tourist town. I'm not going to go into the identity of Dominical Haitians um, a lot right in the talk, but I do in the book because Dominico Haitians is really a contested category. Um, a lot of people will say that there is no such thing as Dominico Haitian, but then there's an increasingly a lot of social movement activists that are um, Dominicans by birth because they were born in the Dominican Republic, but they're Haitian by nationality. Um, you know, their parents were born in the Dominican Republic and they call themselves Dominico Haitians. And so I use all three of these identities in order to talk about intercultural differences. The objectives that I have in the book are pretty much fourfold. I wanted to unpack the process of Fiao and what in it's what I call emergent morality. So in all of the in the face of all of this intercultural like mishmash in this community, how do people talk about whether or not they should be using Fiao or in-store credit to buy food? Um, I also wanted to differentiate the variables, variables that people use to distinguish what they call gente responsable or responsible people from those who aren't. And what you're going to hear is that um, people can be, the same person can be gente responsable and not. Um, it just depends on uh, the, the tourist market. I wanted to show you in the book that I wanted to reveal the hidden labor associated with that. People work really hard. Um, in all kinds of ways, particularly when they become indebted and they work really hard to pay it off in all kinds of ways, shoppers um, and shopkeepers, both. I also wanted to determine whether FIAO, this in-store credit to buy food, if it moderates racism or anti-Haitianism between Dominicans and Haitians. And I go into detail in my book about what anti-Haitianism is and how it's sort of a system, like it's a hierarchy and it's a system of you know, fitting people into the hierarchy whereby people who are Haitian by nationality or by heritage are put on the bottom. It's sort of a racial designation, but I, I, I quickly want to tell you that social constructions of races in the Dominican Republic are very different than they are in the U.S. So what happens is that with U.S. eyes, very often if you look at a Haitian and a Dominican, sometimes their complexion will be the same, but they will be distinguished as either black or Haitian or some sort of Dominican racial classification that does not include black. So there's a lot of um, negotiation between and among people as to who fits in to this hierarchy and where. And I wanted to see if in-store credit uh, worked to affect that in any way. Just real brief, this is a, this is a um, satellite image of the community where I work. And so I worked in two neighborhoods. This is called the Callejón de la Loma. In Spanish, that means the alley of the hill, and it sort of looks like an alley, right? So here's this beautiful beach 
with all of the you know resorts and five star hotels and everything. Um, and this is where most of the people who serve people umbrella drinks and you know get people their towels and serve people food and make sure the gardens are kept and that's where they live. They also live here, which is called La Cienega, which in Spanish means the swamp. And it most certainly is a swamp. You can see right, um, here's my little, right here is a big lagoon. Um, my kids actually went to school uh, right next to the lagoon. It's very swampy, lots of mosquitoes. And so these are the two communities where the people who work in the lower echelon of the international tourist economy, this is where they live. And this is where I lived um, for a period of time, summers of 2011 and 2013. July to December of 2014, and then February and March of 2015. Um, I did participant observation and archival research. I worked with um, comaderos or shopkeepers in 12 comados, six in the Callejón and six in La Cienega. I um, conducted interviews in both uh, Creole, uh, Spanish, and sometimes English. I did two interviews in English. Um, with shoppers and shopkeepers and distributors and also um, NGO workers and um, internationals of all sorts. And so basically these two neighborhoods, La Cienega and the Callejón, have about 7,000 residents in them. 65% of them are Dominican, 30% are Haitian, and 5% are people I call international, um, usually uh, college age-ish people who are there taking a gap year or doing an internship um, or doing a, a long-term um, volunteer uh, with different organizations. So let's talk about Colmados. Um, uh, uh, um, from Christian uh, Crone Hansen from the University of Oslo uh, wrote a book about Colmados in Washington Heights in New York City. And he said, Colmados for Dominicans are what he called a total social phenomenon. It's sort of this Mausian perspective on, you know, like the, 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 the seat of Colmados is everything, right? It's, it's like where people, you know, shop. It's where people work. It's where people meet people. It's where people are entertained. You know, there's, there's movies and songs and, and all kinds of stuff about Colmados. But the really thing is, is that there's not a lot written about Colmados, certainly not in the Dominican Republic. In the early 1990s, there was an ethnography of two Colmados in Santo Domingo, um, it, which was extremely helpful to me in my research. But I found that in the 20 odd ensuing years between when the book came out and was researched and when I was working there, Colmados had changed a lot, and especially because um, the way that uh, Gerald Murray, the, the author of Colmados, talked about Colmados at that time was that um, Haitians, um, you know, either were non-existent in the community where he worked or they were not given in-store credit to buy food, which that certainly was not what happened with me when I was on the, the North Coast. And so I want you to know that um, Colmados are the preferred shopping venue of all Dominicans and, and Haitians, particularly working class people. And primarily it's because um, they can get food that is that they're comfortable with, that they, that they understand, that they want, but it's also um, because they can buy food on credit. Um, since the year 2000, the Dominican Republic has, uh, buying food in the Dominican Republic has, has you know, uh, been in increasingly expensive. So expensive that they're the second most, food is the second most expensive in the Dominican Republic in the whole hemisphere next to Guatemala. And so people go to Colmados because they can find lo criollo, right? Or like the homegrown food. And my book talks a lot about what homegrown food is and, and its relationship to the history of, of Colmados coming about. In fact, Colmados came about because there were a lot of food deserts in the Dominican Republic, particularly because of rural to urban migration. I also talk about who shops in them, when and how. And a lot of people are surprised by this, but um, women are not the only people who are buying food in these colmados. In fact, lots of women during the morning will send their kids um, to go buy food and the kids will then put their uh, purchases on a tab. That's what I mean by this in-store credit. Um, but also men, especially men on their way home from work, their mother, their, their, their partners, their female partners will say, hey, stop by and get this and get this and this, this. And they'll sometimes, you know, stop at the colmado and during the hour that, they, that they're there, it'll turn into a colmadon um, 
in a comadón is essentially like a dance hall. It's it's essentially a place where where people can drink rum, drink cold beer, and dance and play pool, different things like that. Um, I also talk about the labor of shopkeepers. So what I want you to know is part of this total social phenomenon is that shopkeepers are astutely aware that colmados are, and a lot of people told, said this phrase time and time again, colmados are keeping people's bellies full. And they don't just mean that people are shopping at colmados and buying food. They're, they're actually, they actually mean that like they're, like Comados are the center of economic activity for all kinds of people. So for instance, if you shop at Comados, you can get your foods delivered and they're often delivered on a motoconcho and a motoconcho is a um, motorcycle taxi. And so motorcycle taxi drivers, um, you know, just do so well economically when there's a lot of Comados around. Um, the, you see this boy right here? Um, in this photo, this boy, he's, a, he's, he's 12 years old, and he's called an ayudante. And a lot of, especially young adolescent boys, get their first start in colmados as ayudantes. And so as you see, colmados aren't open-shelved shops. They're closed-shelved shops. And so when a, when a customer comes in, like this woman right here in the photo, she'll ask the ayudante, please go behind the counter and get me some rum, get me some carnation, they call it carnation, but it's evaporated milk or, you know, sweetened condensed milk, get me some toilet paper, you know, get me um, a can of, um, you know, habichuelas or stewed beans, please get me, you know, 10 pesos or 20 pesos or 50 pesos of uncooked rice or things like that. And so these kids, um, get paid for that. And they sort of get their start. Very often, a lot of these kids leave the colmados after being an ayudante for some time. They age out of that role. And then they go to places like Santo Domingo to a bigger colmado. And sometimes they even go to the States. And, you know, they, they migrate there to be, um, and sometimes they start, you know, they'll buy a colmado and own one. And they be, it's basically a route to being an entrepreneur. Also, these colmados are extremely important for women because there's lots of women who have cottage industries. So they make, you know, stewed beans uh, or arepas, which are like cheese, cornish kind of, of pastries. They'll make, they'll sometimes make caramelos, which are these like um, caramel candies. They'll make all this stuff and they'll know the colmadero, the, the shopkeeper, and the shopkeeper will allow them to set up a table outside their colmado and cook and, um, you know, so that people can buy cooked food. And this is extremely helpful for the women who make this food, but also for women who are responsible for the biggest meal of the day, which is lunch. So if you are a woman who works outside the home, you often will buy this food from women outside these colmados. And so, and so um, you know, there's a gender dynamic in the colmado, but it's not as it's not as typical as you might think, like just women are going in and purchasing stuff and all shopkeepers are, are men. It, it, that's not true. Women are very often shopkeepers and shoppers are often men. So let's talk about FIAO. FIAO is the in-store credit uh, that, I, that I've been talking about. And FIAO is, if, if Colmados are a total social phenomenon, so is FIAO. Fiao is everywhere. And so you see right here on the side of this, this is a um, muebleria, this is a, a furniture store and it says todo fiao, like everything in store credit. You see this right here, this was a sign outside a lottery house. It says no fiao a nadie. I don't, I don't give anybody in store credit, right? But then you see this, this sign up here and it was sort of um, tongue in cheek. It says, Mr. Credit was killed by Mr. No pay, laid to rest by Mr. No trust. What a pity, in deep sympathy, only cash. And the fact that I'm reading that in English really in this part of the world means that this, um, this sign, um, the audience for this sign is tourists, right? So just even though Fiao is a total social phenomenon, not everybody gets Fiao, right? So tourists, because they're gonna leave, are not eligible for Fiao. Nobody would give in-store credit to a tourist. But also there's lots of people who are not eligible for Fiao, and, and, and you know, that's what I discuss in the book. So there are three types of Fiao, right? The first type of Fiao is giving credit to someone who will pay it back. That's a person that's called gente responsable. I'll never forget the first few times I started asking my interviewees, what does it mean to be gente responsable? And they looked at me like I was crazy, like I didn't understand normal, you know, economic transactions. And I said, no, no, no. The reason why I ask is because with the ebb and flow of the tourist seasons, I know 
that on in any given month, there's somebody who used to be gente responsable who now no longer has a job because there are no tourists. So there's no tourists to be in the restaurants, to be in the hotels, to be in the... And so there are people who used to be able, they, they used to be able to pay off their tab, right? But when this tourist season, you know, ebbs or, you know, goes down and decreases, um, these people can't pay off their tab, but they still need to eat, right? And so there's another type of fiao that is at work in the Callejón and La Cienega, and that's gift giving. So there are people who will go to Colmados and they'll say, look, I'm hungry, my baby's hungry, I need diapers, I need eggs, I need powdered milk, I need all this stuff. Can you please, you know, put this on my tab? And really, honestly, what they're meaning is charity. <coughs> Mo the, the, the shopkeepers who are most often asked for that kind of fiao are women. And I talk in the book about this feminist ethics of care. Um, I talk about the fact that uh, this virtual womanhood, this virtuous, this vir not virtual, virtuous womanhood that is sort of drawn upon or this marianismo that people are drawing upon to say, look, you know, this woman is, is a mother, she's a grandmother, she'll take care of me. And if I ask her for a gift, she'll give it to me. And, and that often happens. Men, are, men shopkeepers are asked for gifts too, but women are more often asked for gifts. But the thing is, you know, shopkeepers can only give so many gifts because if they give too many gifts, they can't pay their own debts. Shopkeepers have debts too. And so it's this really fragile economy that is at work here, that if, if shopkeepers give fiao to somebody who will not pay their debt, then, you know, not only does, you know, like not only do people not eat, but colmados go under, they go into financial ruin. And so shopkeepers are the real cornerstone for, you know, and so they have to make these decisions every single day, every single hour as to who they're gonna lend to and why. And then there's this third type of fiao. And this means giving credit to someone who is not known as gente responsable. That means that, um, uh, you, know, s s you know, either the, the shopkeeper doesn't know that person or the shopkeeper knows that that person doesn't have a job right then. And when that happens, you know, if somebody says, dame fiao or fiame, por favor, like, please put it on my tab, the shopkeeper will then say to that shopper, look, no, you have to go find a reference. And what, long story short, what that means is that that shopper needs to go find somebody that the shopkeeper knows and trusts, right? They bring the, sh the, the reference there, that person, they bring them there or they call them and they have them talk to the shopkeeper and the reference says to the shopkeeper, you can put their purchases on my tab, right? And so this taking on somebody else's debt right? It cements these interpersonal relationships between the borrower and the creditor. I call them borrower-creditor relations, right? But it also mitigates the risk to the shopkeeper because the shopkeeper is just like one payment away from not being able to keep the shop open. And so it's this really handy system. And what I found in my work is that Haitians, as often as not, are referencing for Dominicans, and Dominicans are referencing for Haitians, women are referencing for men, men are re referencing for women in this really intricate way. And so what that does is it helps people cast a wide social safety net that they can draw need. And the reason why this is so important is because not only do Dominicans own colmados, but Haitians do too. Like for instance, this man right here is, is a Haitian man. His colmado is one of the um, one of the emptiest, I talk about empty colmados are those that um, are going into financial ruin. So let's talk about gente responsable. Um, you know, so what this means is that people are trying to negotiate and understand what, what I call moralities of responsibility and care. So who are you responsible for? Are you responsible for yourself? Are you responsible for your neighbor? You know, are you responsible to the, the, the colmado owner? Because if, if you don't pay your debt, then it'll go under and then nobody can eat. And so what becoming gente responsable means is that you build trust by vouching for others to cast a wide net. Shopkeepers and distributors 
can be gente responsable. So what I mean by distributors are people who show up usually on motorcycles or very tiny um, like trucks, like they're Chinese models or Korean model trucks, they're very tiny, and they're bringing food to the colmados so that the stores can stay open. So shopkeepers and distributors are balancing their need to maintain shop, shoppers, right? So they open, you know, their cuadernos. Cuadernos are these notebooks that actually record all of the purchases made um, on people's tabs. Like, you know, there are no credit cards, this is nothing's done by a computer. It's literally these school notebooks. You've got somebody's name up top. You've got the sums, and, and then the scratches out are, are when people pay their debt, right? And so they have to, you know, open cuaderno, open their cuaderno enough, open these notebooks, but remain in business. So they have to be able to pay their own bills. Shoppers or are balancing their moralities of responsibility and care by balancing their own cuentas or their own you know, pages in the notebook while maintaining good relations with customers who often help them stay afloat. So if somebody, if people ask a shopper, a person like, will you vouch for me? Can you be my reference? And somebody keeps going, no, 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 no. What's gonna happen is when the tourist season ebbs and they need you know, credit, if you know, their colmado goes under that they always get credit from and they have to go to a new shop, and they keep saying no to other people, they won't, they won't be their reference, then people are gonna, they're gonna turn around and not say no to them, right? So it doesn't pay for you to keep saying no to people, but you have to say no to the right people. And that's a, that's a social process. It's really intricate. It, 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 there's a lot of vulnerability of shoppers and shopkeepers, right? Because, and so what this means is that by, by being a reference, everybody's a borrower and creditor. It's not just shoppers, are the are the borrowers and shopkeepers are the creditors everybody is right and so um yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna skip that instead i'm gonna go to the hidden labor right so there's a lot of hidden labor that goes into the borrower create creditor relations so so what i found in the results of my work was that there's lots of intercultural lending and it's a bit more often than intracultural lending. So what I mean is that there are more Dominicans vouching for Haitians and more Haitians vouching for Dominicans than there are Dominicans vouching for Dominicans and Haitians vouching for, vouching for Haitians, right? In order to make sure that if you, if you provide a reference for somebody, right, that means that if, if that person walks away from their debt, you're on the hook for it. You have to pay that debt. And so what happens is that people who are references for others, they have to make lots of visits to borrowers for debt repayment. And in fact, in all of my research, I found that very often just for like a, a normal debt repayment, which is about a hundred um, pesos, which is about a couple and a half, three bucks, uh, you know, depending on the year and the exchange rate. Um, what I found is that people are making visits to borrowers at least 10 times. And that's a, that's a lot of work. They have to take time out of their day. They go in their lunch hour. It takes them away from, you know, buying, you know, uh, uh, cooking their meals and being with their families or, or, you know, being entertained or going to a ball game or whatever. There's also a lot of hard work that shopkeepers need to do. Um, you know, without being vigilant about who they're going to offer um, fiao to, they could actually go into financial ruin. And if they go into financial ruin, very often what happens is um, some neighborhoods uh, are bereft of a place that they were able to, you know, be, you know, be food secure. And so one of the really intriguing findings that I, that I found was that those shops that were empty, so those shops that went into financial ruin, and you see a couple of, um, uh, this shop and this shop were two of the emptier. Uh, this was one of the empty, very empty shops, but this was one of the emptier shops um, in the Callejon in La Cienega during my research. One is um, owned by a woman and, and one is um, owned and managed by a man. And what typifies empty shops is that they offer more in-store credit without requiring a reference. So what happens to woo shoppers, they offer in-store credit. And these colmados that don't have a lot of, you know, inventory, right? They're trying to woo shoppers so that they can, you know, shoppers can spend money. And so they'll do it 
without maintaining that vigilance, right? And so they'll often, very often people will um, know that these empty shops are their shop of last resort for getting in-store credit, right? Even if they're not gente responsable. I found that Haitian shopkeepers were the most vulnerable. So out of the three um, emptiest shops uh, that I did my field work in, two of them were owned by Haitian women. The third was owned by um, a Dominican man. And then, so, so in those scenarios, when, um, you know, neighborhood, neighborhoods had fewer colmados, colmados had less inventory, um, you know, shoppers found it difficult to get in-store credit. What I found was that there were a lot of food sharing and meal sharing practices, right? So um, people would essentially, especially for the lunch hour, because that's the biggest meal of the day, they would be going from home to home of the people they know, and they would be given like a piece of fried breadfruit or, you know, some rice or, you know, some chicken or maybe some beans, right? And so a lot of people would say to me, you know what, Christina, I have not even eaten a grain of rice today. And not even a grain of rice is a really common refrain in the Dominican Republic, but like all this time, I would hear that refrain from that phrase from people and I knew that they had eaten that day. But what they were saying to me when they said, I haven't even eaten a grain of rice today, they didn't really mean that they didn't eat. What they meant was that nobody was vouching for them. Nobody was referencing them. Nobody was giving them fiao. You know, colmado, you know, they, they could only shop at empty colmados with very little stuff. And so they couldn't get the homegrown food, lo criollo, that they really, you know, la criolla food that they really wanted. Um, and it was sort of like when they made that comment, not even a grain of rice, they were lamenting the, the, the impact of decreasing distrustful like increasing distrustful social relationships. So in conclusion, I just want to say that becoming gente responsable in the Dominican Republic revolves around along these axis of, you know, moralities of care and responsibility. Like, who am I supposed to care for? What is my responsibility? Who is my responsibility? But then people are sort of, are sort of negotiating, like, like who, you know, who is it, who is it? The supposed to be responsible for the other? Am I supposed to be responsible just for me? And often those who are gente responsable, they can be part of the group held in contempt, whatever, whatever that group is. So Dominicans, I would hear so often in all kinds of venues, Dominicans are all lazy dogs. I heard it all the time. And then, you know, from Haitians. And then from the flip side, from Dominicans, I would always hear Haitians are thieves. They're coming, they're stealing our, our jobs, they're doing all these things. And so, but but the, the fascinating thing is, is that Haitians and Dominicans are looking to each other in order to keep people food secure. Like they're creating these trustful, the, these trusting relationships, even as this racist rhetoric and anti-Haitian rhetoric still raises its ugly head, right? And so another thing that I found in my research that I want to, and, and I could talk more about it later, is that even though in-store credit is extremely important and it's imperative for all of these working class families, these really hard workers to provision their households, getting, getting in-store credit, getting a tab at these stores does not decrease poverty in the region. In fact, it makes people more indebted. Just so you know, there is no, no interest. There's no interest. These are just tabs. You bring up a tab. Um, but, uh, what can happen is that people can be extremely poor in the social relationships that they need in order to survive. So I wanna let you know that um, I, I'm so grateful that you're here listening to my talk. I really hope that you'll order my book. Um, I hope you'll teach it in your classes. And if you don't order my book, maybe you can order it for your institution's library. I want you to know that in 2021, um, the publisher of the book is offering a 30% discount on both the hardback and the ebook. And the ebook was just discounted um, a lot. Uh, the hardback, it's a, it's a hardback book without a jacket, so the, the image is on the book. So it's, it's an expensive hardback book, but the ebook is, is economical. It's, 
it's uh, a fair price. Um, and if you do that, if you, you, can't, you can buy it on Amazon, but if you want to use the discount, you can't get it on Amazon. You have to go to the um, publisher's website. That's all I have.